OK, thanks. So I, I will try to uh, talk a little bit of what we are doing in, uh, in Toulouse about natural and anthropic variability of atmospheric deposition of trace elements and radionuclides in remote areas. And uh, that's what I will say it's one part of, of my job uh, in, in Toulouse uh, as a CNRS researcher, uh, trying to make people together, working together about uh, especially the mountains because we are really close to the Pyrenees mountain. So uh, thanks Bill, who I am. So I am, a, as, as Bill say, I am an isotope biogeochemist and I'm a member of uh, Ecolab. So on here, you see the logo. And I'm a member of the CNRS and also uh, working at the university. Uh, we are different sponsors, Europe, CNRS, INR, because it's a French national uh, science foundation and also some national parks and so on. So um, just briefly, just to tell you, and also perhaps you will understand more why I'm working on radionuclides, but also uh, trace metals and so on. So like, like, like Bill said, I made my PhD with him in Heidelberg. Uh, so it's beautiful, beautiful castle and so on. And then I moved to to make a postdoc position uh, in uh, close to Aix-en-Provence, to Marseille, where I was working on uh, atmospheric deposition, for example, of uh, nuclear or Chernobyl uh, cesium. Yet the activity of cesium in France mapped, and that's, I mean, that was quite important at this time because there were some uh, people saying, yeah, we got some concerns about uh, because of the of the Chernobyl cloud and so on. And uh, so I worked for the ERSN, and I'm working always with them. They have a lot of facilities to measure radionuclides. And then I moved to Liège. So an, another topic, uh, and I, we were always uh, using peat bogs also, you will see. And uh, in Liège, it's an old university, and uh, it's an old university and based also a lot of uh, engineering on metallurgy and so on. It's very, very polluted. It's one of the most polluted areas in Europe also with Poland and so on. So it's quite famous. So all the economy was based on the metal smelter and so on. Uh, the, the last smelter uh, closed some years ago, but um, most of the economy is based on, on, on the smelter. You, you see here the football uh, stadium is, was paid by, by the, this type of money. And then I moved to Toulouse, so I make like this. And it's quite important, I, I'm working in Toulouse, and I'm working in what's called Observatoire Midi-Pyrénées, so not only we are working in, in some u small university, big university of Toulouse, but we have also an observatory in the mountains. People doing planetology, astrophysics, and so on. And it's a very old observatory. And we have a lot of common facilities. I'm working at Ecolab, uh, and I'm a member of the biogeochem team. That's all the members. Perhaps you know some of them. They are hydrologists, uh, Jean-Luc Propes, José Miguel Sanchez Pérez. And uh, two of them, me and François Devlet Chouvert, we are not on the picture because we were on the field, and that's what we are doing uh, almost of the time. So the team is working on transfer at atmosphere, plant, soil, water interface, transfer in water catchment. And uh, we are member of uh, different uh, labs, working also with people from Edmonton, people from, from uh, South America, people from different labs in Toulouse in France to investigate uh, natural and anthropic variability of atmospheric deposition. Uh, why is that? So all of you know, okay, just, just to tell you I'm more a geochemist than a biogeochemist. I'm just, uh, so you know that, I mean, humans change a lot uh, their environment. Here it's the uh, earth move by humans in, in Gcotton by year. It, it's a paper published by Hook in Geology. And you can see that since the Neolithic, since the agricultural revolution, uh, humans have a major influence on, 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 uh, on the environment. And, uh, and especially since the last two or 300 years, because of uh, oil, because of coal combustion, uh, and, and the energy produced by this, uh, humans is changing a lot its environment. Some people, like uh, here a guy from Stockholm, uh, Rockström, identified some boundary layers, some planetary threshold. And I'm interested, and the lab is interested by different of, of this one here in gray, and especially chemical pollution, which is not clearly quantified because, for example, ecotoxicological uh, and ecological uh, test on, on, uh, on chemical pollutants is not clearly identified. You can have cocktails of pollutants, and, and their effects are not well known. 
and also atmospheric aerosol loading. It's not well quantified. Uh, there are effects on climate change, the effect on nutrient inputs is not well quantified. And that's the two major issues. I, I, I'm trying to, to give some information about that. So first, yeah, the aerosol cycle impact. Of course, you have many, many sources of impact, like desert, uh, industry, also agriculture. And it has a large impact on remote area, like mountains or Arctic or subantarctic uh, places. For example, it has also a, a global impact. It's, it's mo modified from the IPCC, so you have the different uncertainties on, on greenhouse gas. And here I just put also the uncertainties because of the aerosol loading. So you see that there is a direct e effect, negative effect on the on climate change and also on the biogeochemical effect. And the red line here are the uncertainties. And they are really, really huge. So we need more data to understand to to understand this. So that's the first thing I am interested in. And the second one is there are also new new metals, new pollutants, emerging pollutants, which are produced here. For example, the, this is the curve of the atmospheric antimony emission from coal commission in China. Uh, and, and this type of pollutants, you can find them back in really remote area. Like that's the study of, of Michel Krasler. Uh, he was in Heidelberg working with Bill, and, uh, and they show that instead of lead here, who was decreasing in an ice core uh, in the Arctic island, antimony was not decreasing and was more or less stable. And you have always this type of emerging em uh, metals which can be transported really far away. And what are their effects on, on, on the environment? So I'm trying to, to have a, an interdisciplinary review on that. So, and interested, like I say, at, at this, and this is clearly really important because it is the head of the watershed. And in Europe, most of the mountains are providing the water and, and, and good water. And as a geochemist, I'm not only um, interested by, by the spatial uh, variability, but also the time variability. Okay, and time variability of atmospheric deposition and after that, the legacy and the fate of these contaminants in the mountains. For that, I'm using different tracers, different isotopic tracers, like two, two stable lead isotopes, 206, 207, 208, ne neodymium isotopes, mercury isotopes, rarest elements. And also to have a geochronological information, I'm using a geochronological marker and geochronological uh, uh, isotopes like 210 lead, cesium, or americium, or 14C. So this type of work was done already since some years ago by guys like famous geochemists like Claire Patterson, Carl Turekson. I'm not inventing uh, anything, just using the d new techniques, new, new way to do it routinely. But most of the ID, you can find them in their papers. So I'm using especially uh, the uranium thorium series decay. And I'm interested, as Bill said, by the stable lead isotopes, 208, 207, 206, to trace the source of lead. But I'm interested also by 210 lead, which is a radiogenic and radioactive element with an half-life of 20 years. It's very useful. It's re useful as a tracer of aerosols. It's produced by radon e exhalation and radon emanation in the air. And uh, because uh, radon is a gas and then it's decaying in, a, in, a, in 210 lead, which is a metal, it's absorbed on, 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 on aerosols, and it's a good tracer of uh, aerosols falling onto the ground because of rain, because of uh, fog, and so on. And it can be used, uh, yeah, it can be used as a good tracer of aerosols. Here are some results from uh, Puy de Dome in the Massif Central in France, where you can see that uh, uh, the activity of tooth and lead is really related to uh, submicronic aerosols uh, around one micron of size. So it's a very good tracer. It's, it's a very good also geochronological tracer. That's results from, from a, a bug investigated by, Big some, by Bill some years ago. And uh, we did some measurements of 210 lead. And we use this as a geochronological marker to compare with also 14C bomb pulse curve and also cesium marking here in, in, in North America, the peak of nuclear weapon test. So we, have, uh, we are using 210 lead in several ways in order to at understand the aerosol's phase and also to use it as a geochronological marker. So I will, I will come back. So that's part of my, uh, my job also to, to combine different approach to, to, 
to use this. And, and this is especially the case when, when you're dealing with, uh, with this type of tracer. I'm interested by the temporal variability, as I said. So we can use lake sediments, but we can use also peat bogs. You're surely aware about that. And uh, why peat bogs? Because there are, uh, some of them are ombrotrophic, and that means that there are, uh, <coughs> there are nutrients and then trace metals are only coming from the atmosphere. And you can, uh, for some of them, uh, trace back, uh, for example, the, the, the inputs like lead uh, along the time, uh, making some, uh, uh, sorry. So why, why it's useful also because it's, it's well distributed over the world. And uh, instead of ice core, where you can find them only in the ice cap and then in high mountain, high altitudes, uh, myers are well distributed. That's most many sites where we are working uh, in, in, in Canada, Patagonia, and also in France. You see that we are trying to make some transect and so on. And so they are uh, really useful because, of course, deeper it is, older it is. And if you have good age dating methods, you can trace back uh, the, the chronology of trace elements and so on. So we developed also with Bill and, and then also in Toulouse some methods to cut the pit core. So we, we are cutting them, trying to also uh, decontaminate, it, uh, decontaminate them uh, like it, it is uh, for, for, for ice cores. So here it's just distilled water, I mean uh, ultra pure water. And one centimeter in the deeper part is representing something like 30 years of accumulation. So you have a quite good resolution for the last 10, uh, 20,000 years of, of peat accumulation of history of, of Earth. Um, so we are decontaminating them and cutting them. So the edges are uh, not used. And, and, and we are cutting them and separate, uh, <coughs> sharing them with other colleagues, studying pollens, vegetation change, and so on. We're using ceramic ma um, knife and so on, so this type of stuff. Uh, if you want to, to discuss that more further, I, I, further I can, can do it later. So we got some samples to do some uh, analysis, geochemistry, age depth, and so on. And we can, for example, try to reconstruct the dust input uh, in, uh, in Europe since the last 10,000 years. And that's quite uh, important because, uh, for example, Saharan dust is increasing uh, in the western part of the Mediterranean Sea uh, since the last 20 years. So we want to know what are the effects on that, uh, what are the effects on, on, on biogeochemical cycles, but also just on air quality because the European rules on air quality are quite often uh, <coughs> sometimes uh, in cities like Madrid or, or Roma, uh, you have more uh, PM. 10 daily concentration than uh, 50 microgram per uh, cubic meter. And this is just because of, 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 of Sarah dust. Uh, the rules change uh, since uh, I, I, I made this slide, but this slide. And uh, again, also, it has a large impact on also on, on, on climate change and, 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 uh, and on, on, uh, and on the, uh, we say, radiation balance. So we reconstruct, here are the chronology with, uh, with different colleagues, including Bill. We reconstruct the, the history of dust input using uh, lithogenic elements like titanium. i just move, make a zoom here. Like titanium in blue here. And uh, also to trace the source of dust, we use neodymium. So we just trace back the, the dust coming in, in the pit. And here we, I made just a zoom for uh, the early middle Holocene transition. And you see that there are some inputs, like here, it's a pit bog from Switzerland, that you have some input from volcano, which are quite important, uh, with a huge increase of the titanium concentration or of the dust flux. But you have also a huge increase from other source, and we can trace back this uh, using neodymium isotopes to Sahara dust. So uh, this event is quite, I mean, this early middle Holocene transition is quite well known. There are some chronological uh, questions about that. But at least during this period, there was a <coughs> big climatic change, quite abrupt. And it has also uh, some relationship with uh, Saharan dust input in, in, in Europe, with more winds, perhaps, or with a uh, larger aridification of the Sahara. If you go it, go a little bit further and you, you go for, for, for a long train, you can see also that there is neodymium isotopes uh, signature changing in the pit bog 
uh, more or less at the same time as the aridification of the Sahara as traced back by models or uh, oceanic cores. So there was very interesting results. And we can distinguish the dust coming from a local source and, and, and from the Sahara also be using pollens and say, okay, no, that's not more dust because of the agriculture of deforestation. That was not the case. At this time, there were no humans in, 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 in Switzerland cutting forests. They come later and they put, uh, for example, here that uh, Plantago lancelota, it's pollen tracing uh, agriculture and, 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 and pastoralism in, in the mountains. So it's very useful and, and our conclusion was we can tr make a chronology of the dust input and, and saying that, for example, more than 2% of the dust was coming from eruptions uh, for the Holocene in, in Switzerland. And also many uh, dust <coughs> came abruptly during the Saharan event in less than 50 years. So it was really uh, an important result. And it has surely influence on, on the vegetation. As I, I won't show you the results, but on, on the pollen, for example, you can see that there are some change in the vegetation, surely because of the biogeochemical input of these nutrients, of these specific nutrients. Some people are arguing also that there are some uh, influence, of course, uh, on dust falling on the ocean and making algae bloom and so on. So you have also potential impact on the CO2 uh, global cycle. Of course, the last uh, slide I show you, you have a new human influence on dust uh, since the Neolithic. So you, you can see here that, for example, the neodymium signature is coming back to local sources, making that uh, <coughs> and you, you, we can show that uh, following deforestation and agriculture, you have more dust in the air. So I, I'm not interested only by uh, temporal variation, but also by uh, spatial variation. And, and for that, we can use uh, natural radionuclides like 210 lead and artificial radionuclides like the nuclear weapon test produced uh, radionuclides like w cesium or plutonium. And uh, what is very useful is that they were not produced or they are not produced in, in the air column in the same way. Uh, 210 lead, because it's produced by uh, the emanation of uh, radon 222, is enriched in the air column, in the troposphere, in the lower troposphere. And cesium and plutonium, they were produced by uh, high energy uh, explosion in, uh, in the 70s, the 60s, 50s, and uh, their uh, distribution in the air column is more homogeneous. So we can use them as a tracer of uh, the vertical origin of aerosols. We can trace occult deposition, for example, fog uh, interception by a canopy, or also we can trace back the feeder cedar effect, which is just that a small cloud on the top of a mountain is fed by a, by a higher uh, stratus cloud and making more rain, so scavenging more aerosols on the top of the mountain. So we can make some mass balance model. I won't enter into detail. And we can also some make me some measurements. Here are some measurements in soil. So we look at the inventory of soils and use them I, like a rain gauge. And just looking at 210 lead plutonium ratio, just to simplify, you have here three different mountains in France. One is Montagne Noire, so it's close to Toulouse, close to the Mediterranean Sea. One is Chêne des Puits, is a massive central, Clermont-Ferrand, and one is Savoie, so in the Alps. And you can see uh, that with the altitude, the 210 lead plutonium ratio on, on in the soils are increasing, showing that there is more 210 lead deposited than uh, nuclear weapon test radionuclides derived. And we can show with a small mass balance model, which was developed uh, by Turekian some years ago by, uh, in, in North America, that more than 50% of 210 lead deposited in altitude sites, so more than 50% of 210 lead and aerosols, are derived from occult deposition and feeder cedar mechanism. This is very huge, huge uh, quantity of, uh, of aerosols deposited by this type of meteorological, uh, uh, par uh, of this type of uh, yeah, processes, meteorological processes. So we need to, to better understand the spatial distribution of oro what we call orographic deposition of uh, European mountainous areas. And of course, its effect on atmospheric contaminants, because some contaminants are also deposited by uh, orographic deposition, and we need better mapping. So this type of human and atmosphere, uh, 
atmospheric contaminants can be lead. It's quite well known. Many people investigated lead. Here are some results about uh, the first uh, record of lead you can find in different pit bogs in Europe. And, and for example, we have this famous example in, in, in of Lindobog in Manchester. Uh, we were working with Bill and we were able to show that uh, uh, we can trace back here the lead story since uh, the last uh, 4,000 years. And you can really follow here that the lead in blue and you can really see the Roman pollution by Romans, but you can see that it's earlier than the Roman occupation. And that's really interesting because you can see the beauty of a uh, high resolution chronology of pit cores. And you can see also here the me medieval peak of lead, where English people, they were using uh, not only lead, but they were also mining silver, and, and, and the lead was a related product. And you can see also some very nice things, for example, here that's a war between France and England, and it, it, it draws down uh, the economy, and it has also surely um, <coughs> sociological uh, consequences, and then, of course, human consequences on, on, on the mining production and so on, on the contamination production. So you can see, you can have a look on, on lead, but you can also have a look on other trace metals like copper or mercury. And we show you some results on mercury we have uh, recently. So that's, uh, mercury is, is, is a tricky element because it's a volatile element. So we have some uh, troubles to explain sometimes the distribution with depth on mercury. So for example, if you look here at of mercury, it's a black line here for four pit cores of the same site in Belgium, quite close to Liège. The distribution is not the same uh, with depths. You see that you have a peak of mercury, which is really deeper for the core number four, and, uh, and that's not the case for, for example, core number six. But if you take into account the h depth model using 210 lead, cesium, and also uh, pollen data, which are here, that's a stratigraphy of the pollen, you can uh, <coughs> combine the four curves and say that uh, telling more or less the same story. And here that's a composite core. You have all the points here and with, a, with the uh, H model, and you have a composite core. It's working not bad. And you, you can tell the story. And for example, I will. you can compare the story here in black. That's the last uh, 30 years of mercury deposition in Belgium, estimated by the pit bog. And here that's a model by EMET, so European uh, association of modelers looking at and model. So it's working not so bad, giving more or less the same numbers. So it's always a story uh, under discussion, but you can have some numbers, you can have some idea about that, and here are the first results of a review of mercury deposition in Europe, uh, some of our measurements, of measurements of, of Bill's groups, of measurements of uh, a group from, from Sweden, and, and you can see that here that's mercury in soils uh, it's an atlas of, of uh, trace elements in, in soils. And you can see that the large part of red here is the most polluted area by mercury. And the, this mercury is coming from atmospheric deposition as it's traced by, by, by the pits. So it's very interesting because some people are arguing that it's just natural geology and it, this is not caused by humans. So coming back to humans, we are interested by, by human interaction. And just to show you um, the idea we are developing in the mountains is not only working uh, with biogeochemists, working with paleo uh, pa uh <coughs> palynologists, is also working with historians and so on, geographers. And we are working in uh, OHM. And so we have this type of observatory. Perhaps you, you all know, they more or less also in the United States, you're observatory working on stable system or more or less stable system, but we are also working on socio-ecological system which are changing with radical changes. And that's what we are interested in. It can be very, very specific during only 10 years. It can be, for example, a bridge between French Guiana and, uh, and Brazil. It will be built. What will be the new contaminants? What will be the uh, socio-ecological consequences? It can be uh, a factory which will cause down, so the pollution will go down. It can be, uh, what can be, it can be also tourism going, coming very quickly. So we have different observatory in France about that, looking at radical changes. And one is in the Pyrenees because uh, there was an aluminium factory which was closed down, so we are interesting about that. And one thing uh, about this observatory is also looking back to the past to, to, to have uh, an idea 
about what happens. So what happens, especially during what we I call it uh, uh, the Holocene pedogenesis. So looking back uh, not only on pre-anthropogenic, pre but also mining and also remote transport and so on. Trying to see different aspects of interdisciplinary research. Here you have some aerial photographs. Uh, so it's from the 80s to now, and you, it's not easy to see, but I will zoom on the picture, and that's postcards, and you can see that's the same landscape. And one photo picture was taken in 76. The altitude is 1,600, no forest. There was a big in huge pastoralism pressure, a lot of animals, a lot of cattle. Then uh, 20 years later, you have a lot of pines, a lot of forests, a lot of uh, <coughs> conifers. And uh, it has a huge impact, of course, on, on the biogeochemical chemical cycles, or on the way also contaminants are transported, on the way nutrients are transported. So that's uh, this type of thing we are interested in. So for example, we can look back also in the past. That's uh, an example of a peat bog. And uh, in the Pyrenees, we have the pollution of lead in a chronological scale. And we can see that in the past, already humans, for example, during uh, the late antiquity, they were, using, uh, they were mining lead, they were mining silver. And for that, they need uh, charcoal. So they were cutting the forest. So we can see the relationship between that. And for the last 200, 300 years, in addition to, to our uh, environmental archives and, and records, we can combine then this with also uh, the work of geographs and the work of, uh, of historians. So this type of things, and even going perhaps until, until uh, uh, genetics uh, studies and so on, and, and see so the different part of, 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 of this aspect. <coughs> so ju just to show you what, wh where we are, so we, we are investigating more atmospheric deposition. And we want also, of course, to, to investigate it in more detail, the legacy and the dynamics of, of, of trace metals. So I have one PhD studying uh, mercury isotopes in, in, in peat bog. So here is this mercury and, and ash and also mercury isotopes along the depths uh, in a peat bog in the Pyrenees. But just to show you uh, how it's efficient mercury isotopes here, you, you can see that's a pre-anthropogenic isotopic signature. It's a 202 mercury <coughs> isotopic signature. And you, you see here the industrial signature. So we can decipher. It's not so easy as, as for lead, but we can really distinguish mercury coming from anthropic input and, 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 and human input and, and, and the pre-anthropogenic uh, mercury cycle. So it's, it's very, very nice. So it's a work in on progress. We are working also, on, on, uh, again, on atmospheric deposition. So we see, you can see that we have also snow last year, and it's very new. We have the most massive snowfall uh, uh, since the last, yeah, since last people know. So we have more than eight meters of snow in the Pyrenees Mountains. So it has a large, large implication on flooding, erosion, uh, everything, everything. Of course, on tourism also, because the snow resorts were, ski resorts were closed. Too much snow, and so we are working also on, on snow deposition and, and, and on its effect on, on, on mountain environments. And the last thing, also, I, I, we are not forgetting, and that perhaps also something interesting for you. We are looking on, at old ancient mines in, in France. So that's uh, uranium mines. So uranium were mined in, in France since the, until the last 80s. It's a very small mines, eh, you, you see. But that's this type of mines which were uh, used for, uh, to develop the nuclear French bomb. So um, we, are using, we are looking at uh, the distribution of, of, of uh, uranium. So Tommy, you see, we have quad too. <laughs> and uh, on, on our quad, we have a gamma spectrometer. So we can look at the distribution, the spatial distribution. For example, here, I think the uranium. 235, so we have this type of, uh, of uh, developing stuff to, to look at, uh, at size, uh, former size of, uh, um, especially in the mountains. So, and finally, uh, at the lab, there, are, uh, there is an eco ecotoxicology uh, team. So, we are working also on uh, emerging um, pollutants like antimony. Here are the results of uh, DNA uh, defects, micronucleus, it's uh, when the cells are dividing. They, they can produce micronucleus. It's uh, uh, an evidence of uh, genotoxicity. 
And you can see here, for example, we buy with different concentration in the nutrient solution for a plant that you have more impact of antimony uh, with increasing concentration. And also, even at very low concentration, at quite low concentration, you have an impact compared to uh, the <coughs> negative test. So uh, we are working on this. And I didn't show the results, but if you put lead and antimony together, it's more genotoxic than lead or antimony apart. So it's very interesting, this type of cocktail. We want to, to look it in more further. So that was for a uh, for bean. So this was a genotoxic effect for a bean. So we are working also on a global scale. So that different project led by, by uh, friends, and uh, especially on, on pit bogs in, in so this type. And so just the take up message, so we Atmospheric accumulation of trace elements is heterogeneous in space and time. And what is the fate of this patchy accumulation? We have to take into account all the scales, because you can say, OK, one site is not polluted or not contaminated. But if you look at one square meter or, or at the mi uh, micron size or nanometric size, you will see that you have a high concentration of, of, of one trace metals and how it impacts the ecosystem susceptibility. So thanks for your attention.